get a little late on the uh, fresh start of 2014, but welcome to 2014. <laughs> Today we're going to see if we can get a fresh start on the year. We're going to learn how we can look at our past and deal with our past that will help us move into the future. You know, on a Christmas carol, um, Ebenezer Scrooge was visited by the ghost of Christmas past, who against his will, he takes him back in time uh, to a time when he was a young man, and he shows him when he was proposing to a woman. And this woman later breaks that engagement because she realized this guy loves money more than me. So as the... the Seeing unfold, you can see that on his face. He's imagine what's going through that guy's mind when he's realizing, looking back now, wow, look at that, look what I did. What a fool he had been. How his life would have been different had he had married her. His heart hadn't been so drawn to money, but kept her in the perspective that she should have been held in. Perhaps that young man wouldn't have become a wretched miser. So consider this today. How would you like a ghost come visit you? How would you like a ghost of Christmas past to take you back to revisit your sins, your mistakes, foolish uh, changes that you have made in your life, choices? How would you like to watch that again, helplessly, knowing that the outcome is going to be unable to change it, feeling that sharp pain of regret, can't do anything about it. And wonder what happened. What would be different if you had made different choices? Most of us, we don't need uh, a ghost to bring us to the past. We do such a good job at it ourselves. We were playing again and again and again in our heads. We projected on the screens of our minds. Don't you sometimes wish you could go back and fix some things that you did, made some different decisions. Talk to yourself with those key moments going, don't do that. I know where that path leads. Try to encourage that. Well, we've all experienced regret in our life, and it takes many forms. Watch this. I'm just going to highlight a few. Regret over marriage. Imagine how much life would be happier and much better if you had married somebody else other than the person sitting next to you today. Or if you had never married uh, that person you're divorced from. What about regret over divorce? Regret over broken relationships in your life. Regret over mistakes raising our kids and our grandkids. Regret over bad career choices. B missed business opportunities. Poor vocational choices. How about has God ever tugged on your heart? He tugged on my heart when I was a young man to go into the ministry. I fought, and I fought, and I fought. And come to find out, that's probably the number one response of men drawn into the ministry, is they reject that. They fight against God. It's a powerful call. Did you do that? Are you doing that? Has he called you to be a missionary? In general, regret over all kind of sins and their consequences. And you think in your life, fill in that blank. Now, sorrow over sin can be healthy, actually. Up to a point. It can help us learn from our mistakes and help us not repeat them. And that's the key to growth. We learn from our mistakes and we don't repeat them. The problem is when we think we've learned and then we turn around and repeat them, we didn't learn. History teaches us we learned nothing from history. This is a sadder but wiser phenomenon. It can lead us to repentance and forgiveness. That's a good thing. And if, if you hold some of these things and you haven't been led that way, that's what you want it to do for you. You want to regret over it and then let it lead you to repentance and to salvation. But regret, on the other hand, is anything but helpful. So it's destructive, debilitating, it can paralyze you, stop you right in your tracks. Uh, your fears uh, become magnified. It allows the sins and mistakes of the past to reach into the present and into your future and paralyze you, stop you. It'll lead you to make more wrong choices and more regrets. 
becomes a vicious cycle. Paul writes in uh, 2 Corinthians 7.10, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, with this message, we all have a past. The beauty that you have shown us is that when we come in humbleness and we repent and we ask you to forgive us of our sins, it is forgotten. It is forgiven and forgotten by you. And we pray that you will help us learn to deal with our past that way. Learn from it. Grow from it. Repent. Ask for forgiveness. Guide us into this message. For your glory and our blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Some people respond to regret by trying to undo consequences of their past choices in, in ways really that are illegitimate. I was talking to the counselor last night about that. And uh, it's amazing how we just pile it on, pile it on, then pretty soon we start making decisions to try to fix it. Man decides he's married to the wrong woman, so what's he do? He says, well, that's wrong. I'll divorce her and marry someone else. He leaves this family shattered. He moves on to only to find out that that second wife wasn't the right one either. Now we're just compounding the problem. We're a couple having sexual relations outside of marriage. Uh, the woman becomes pregnant. They try to undo it. How do they undo it? Let's get an abortion. We've only complicated it, compounded it. Even though in their hearts they know they created a baby, not just a massive sales, they know it. They still make that decision. That abortion is going to lead more guilt, more pain, more regret. It's leading them down a road that they shouldn't be going down. Problem is that we can't undo the past. We can usually just make things worse when we're trying to address it. You may recall the Israelites. They tried to do this in the Old Testament. Disastrous results. Let me summarize it for you. God brought them out of Egypt. He showed them, I am your God. I'm going to bring you out of bondage. He brought them to the border of Canaan. And he said, this is the land I give you. A land described as a land of milk and honey. Before they crossed that border, what they do? Immediately they develop 12 spies. They sent them in. Check out the situation. Two spies came back. Joshua, Caleb, said, we go. Ten said, they too big. We can't fight that. We ain't going in there. Watch this in Numbers uh, 13, 27 to 28. They told him and said, we came under the land where thou sent us and Surely it flowed with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. Moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. But the men that went up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. Sounds like man, doesn't it? So what did the people do? Did they trust God's promises? Did they say, God led me out of Egypt, y'all? God led me to this land. Promised to give it to me. Or did, did they obey him and enter that land? Nope. What did they do? They panicked. They rebelled. Circumstances, they're, with their eyes, they're saying, that guy's big. Oh, they got walled cities. We can't go in there. So they looked at it with man's eyes. As a result, God pronounced judgment on them. He sent them into uh, wander the area for 40 years. Only the children and grandchildren would be brought back into this because of their disobedience. So what did the people do? They regretted their disobedience. You know they had to be in the, in the desert going, yeah, maybe we should rethink that. This didn't work out too good. We should have think, uh, rethink this to do it again. So what did they do? They decided they're going to fix it illegitimately. They're going to fix their problem. First, they disobeyed God, refusing to enter when he said enter. Then they regretted their disobedience, but disobeyed again because God said stay out. They said we're coming in. 